Hey guys, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making. In this episode, we are going to be profiling the plates, meaning we're going to be cutting out the guitar shape into the soundboard plate and the back plate. This might seem like a very simple task, and it is, uh, but I promise there's lots that we can get into here. I'll probably talk about laying out the guitar shape onto the plates and finding the ideal position for it. And, um, you know, I'll get into some bandsaw stuff, just basics on using the bandsaw. But basically, that's one of the big tasks that I have to do today. I have a whole bunch of tops and a whole bunch of backs, and I have to get them all roughly shaped into that guitar shaped profile. But first we're going to start out with your questions. Okay, so the first question I have comes from Martin Loudon and he's asking about my side bending machine setup that I have. Martin asks, how thick is the spring steel? Well, Martin, let's go take a look at it. I got my calipers. Oh, let me take you guys with me. All right, so here's my spring steel after I've removed sides from the bending setup here. And the spring steel that I use is just kind of what I was able to find. And it's actually a little thicker than, at least at the time, than I would have, than, than what I was searching for. And because it's a little extra thick, that's why I've actually added these springs to hold on to the ends so that when you release the sides from the mold, these extra thick uh, spring steel slats here would otherwise have a lot of pressure pushing against your now bent side. And so it was always a worry of mine that as I remove the side from here, all that pressure from the spring steel coming back would cause something to happen with the side. Either I'd, you know, worst case scenario, crack it, or it would just cause it to spring back, which all sides do after you remove them from the mold, but it would cause it to spring back a little bit more than desirable. So anyway, I think it's about 20 or 15. Okay, I'm getting like 12 thousandths of an inch, somewhere between 12 and 15 thousandths of an inch thick, which again is, is fairly thick. I know a lot of guys go a lot thinner on their spring steel, and then they probably don't have to do something like this, but this works, um, especially if you put a little spring there. And I do kind of feel like my sandwich, because I'm using such thick slats, is a little more solid, and it actually holds that heat more. If you think about it, the more metal you have in there, the more that the heat from that thermal blanket is going to spread around and uh, hold. So I do think there is potentially an advantage to these thicker slats. But honestly, it was hard to find slats thinner than 12 thousandths of an inch. Okay, so that is Martin's question. And let's go to the next one. Hey buddy, great channel. Hey buddy. Um, question, what is the name of that tool you use by hand to cut the binding channel? It sounds like Grommel, but I found nothing under that search and similar words, but I need one. Thank you. Okay, oh, by the way, that was Pearson Courtney was his name. Um, so it's called a Grommel but it's G-R-A-M-I-L. I'm gonna show you that tool real quick, just so everybody out there in the internet world knows what I'm talking about. And it's this cool little thing here. So I did a video, uh, actually I've talked about this in a couple different videos, where I talked about how you can actually do all of your binding channel work. You can cut your binding channels completely 
with just this tool and an eighth of an inch chisel. And you can even do a good job of it, if you're careful. It's, it's actually not that difficult to do. Uh, so this is a great option for people who don't have or don't want to invest in a sophisticated uh, binding tower with a router bit kind of setup, okay? Or also if you just like hand tools and you don't like using loud, scary things like routers. Um, I like using hand tools, so I, I do both. I, I mostly use the router setup, but I have done it by hand like this. And it's actually kind of uh, a joy to do. I mean, it's a little scary, but I think that's what makes it fun. And by scary, I don't mean in the same way that a router is scary. I mean a little scary because there's um, definitely, the, the whole time you kind of have the sense that one slip of the hand and you're going to do some serious damage to your channels. But I think that adds, adds to the fun. Anyway, it's not too hard, uh, not too expensive of a tool, very simple. G-R-A-M-I-L. Luthiers Mercantile sells it, or at least they used to. Check them out. Okay, John Cook writes, Hi Eric, thanks for all your videos. As a small time builder, I am always looking for information and secrets, he says in air quotes, from the pros. I have a question and a comment. My question first, must they... <coughs> Excuse me. Must the top and back have a radius? I haven't had anyone explain it to me. It seems like a lot of work sanding the body and the braces to a radius. Also gluing a flat piece of wood to curved wood braces. Seems like putting undue stress on the braces. No wonder they fail. Does this affect the sound? Um, so actually, I, w I really want to latch on to what you said there about the braces failing. The structure, that doming structure, actually helps prevent things like that from happening. It is far more structural than people realize or think. So it's actually very important, even if you are not uh, an absolute tone Nazi, obsessed with the sound, you know, you just want to build a functional guitar. <sighs> Hold on one second, I have a phone call. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, so we are talking about the radius, and John is asking, is the radius necessary? It seems like a lot of work. And yes, it is a lot of work, um, but honestly, John, I think you're, you're trying to avoid this, and really, you need to just accept putting a radius, that, that it's necessary to have a radius on guitars. And here's why. The plates on an acoustic guitar are extremely thin compared to wood that's used for virtually anything else in the woodworking world. And so this wood is extremely unstable and it really wants to move. And it wants to move for two reasons. One, it's hygroscopic. So everyone kind of understands that wood movement is a thing. So wood as temperature and humidity changes happen, that wood is going to warp a little bit, possibly it might cup, or it's gonna bow outward. It's gonna move. The other reason why it's moving is because on an acoustic guitar, there is a great deal of tension on specifically the soundboard from those strings being attached to the bridge and also from a sort of cantilever effect on the fretboard tongue, which also comes from the tension on the strings, but in this case, pulling on the neck. But anyway, great deal of tension, and that wood is guaranteed to move. And so if you build your guitar with dead flat plates, what's gonna happen is that wood is going to go sunken. Now, the plates going sunken is bad for a couple of reasons. Mainly, it's bad because the bridge and the part of the fretboard are attached to the top. So when that plate goes sunken, you get massive splits, specifically where 
um, the wings of the bridge are and where the fretboard tongue attaches, not to mention that glue joint between the bridge and the top is very likely now to not be stable and to come apart. So, and, and like you mentioned, braces falling out, well, when the, when the top goes sunken, for sure you can have braces um, becoming, separating from the top, especially at those points where the splits happen. Main point is sunken is very bad. Um, it also looks bad, by the way, because you might think, oh, well, maybe I'll just do the, the back doesn't have anything glued to it. Uh, it doesn't have a bridge or anything like that. I'll just do the back flat. And you actually could get away with it more so on the back, but when it goes sunken and it has that nice shiny finish on it, it looks uh, bad. It looks weird. You can see the way the light hits it that you have this weird sunken top. But you might not care that much about that, so I understand that. Now, the other reason why the radius matters is for tonal reasons. John had kind of touched on that. He asked about how it affects the sound. And let me explain it this way. What a radius, a doming does, is it gives a significant amount of structure to the plate. And that structure means that the plate requires less bracing. Less bracing means less weight on the top so it can resonate more, okay? Now I'm gonna give you a couple examples to help kind of explain this. In architecture, think of a great domed cathedral or something like that. It actually needs very little, if any, trusses or bracing to hold that ceiling up. Whereas if you think of um, a warehouse building, it's gonna have these big I-beams because it has this big flat roof there's big I-beams holding up that roof because it doesn't have the structure of the doming. Another example is simply a chicken egg. An egg has that round dome structure. It's actually very strong. You think of an egg as fragile, but that's only, it's only fragile when you tap it against the edge of the table. That's what cracks the egg. But if you actually hold the egg in your hand and squeeze it, it's very hard or harder than you think to crush an egg in your hand. You should try it sometime. And it's because that egg structure, the dome of it, is very, very strong. And that strength, just to bring things full circle, <laughs> equals good tone because it means minimal bracing. Okay? Now, I, I do get the sense a little bit that maybe the reason you're asking, I'm just reading between the lines here, is because maybe you, you're not as concerned about making you know, the best sounding guitar in the world, and you just want to build something functional. And I totally get that. Um, it, it is uh, an investment in time and resources to put a radius on your guitar. It's very tempting to want to just work with only flat surfaces. And you can do that, you just need to use far thicker plates. If you used, actually I have something right here that's perfect. Just for the sake of explaining this, if you use something that's, uh, this is like a quarter inch thick, this is very thick. Well now you're not dealing with these thin, flexible, resonant plates that are going to move a lot. It's more like a tabletop. So I actually, think you could, or I'm sure, you could build a guitar that wouldn't eventually fall apart simply by using big thick plates. It would not sound like a guitar. It would sound very bright and it would not have a lot of sustain at all. Um, but it could be functional and it could be, you know, just a fun thing to do if you're not trying to invest a serious amount of time into your building. So I just wanted to throw that out there because, you know, I don't want to be too much of a snob about guitar building. Uh, there are lots of ways to simplify the process, but you do end up with an inferior instrument. And sometimes that's okay. Okay. I think that's it for questions. 
Maybe I have one more. Actually, I do have one more. Okay, this one is actually from the members forum. So when you purchase my online course, Building an OM Acoustic, you also become a member of the members forum. So there's conversations happening in there. And this one is from Hugh Goosen. And he writes, it's more of a comment, but I'm going to treat it like a question. He writes, hi all. Although the 25.34 and 25.4 scale lengths are sometimes understood to be one and the same, I have just discovered that they are not. And he has included here a picture of his LMI uh, template, the fret, slot, fret slotting template, held up against his set of plans. And you can see the discrepancy between his template and the plans because the template is 25.34 inch and his plans are 25.4 inch. And I just wanted to address the difference there because it is an interesting thing. As he pointed out, there is a common understanding, at least in the marketing world of guitars and the world of guitars as it appears to the players and the musicians themselves that the 25.4 inch scale length is one and the same as the 25.34 inch scale length. And to players, it absolutely is. If you built a guitar to 25.34 inch, that precise nominal scale length, it would be functionally you would never be able to tell the difference between that and a 25.4 inch scale length. They're just so close, right? So, uh, it, in terminology, people just round up and call it a 25.4, right? But some companies will literally build it to 25.4 and other ones will actually use the original design scale length of 25.4. 3-4. So it's a not a meaningful difference in the end result to the player, hence the terms being combined, but it is meaningful to know the difference when you're the builder because if you have a set of plans that doesn't match up with, in this case, his template, um, that's something that needs to be reconciled. Now, in your case, Hugh, you can still use the set of plans that you have. And you can still use the template that you have, especially if you're following the process that I happen to use in my online course, which you are, then when you get towards the, the end, when you're locating the bridge and all of that important stuff and cutting the saddle slot, all of that is based off of your fretboard layout as it is. It's not based off of where the bridge is located on your set of plans, if that makes sense. So when you get to that point, if you follow the process, and this is how most guitar builders do it, is you are actually locating the bridge not using your plans, you are just measuring off of your existing fretboard as it is, okay? So I, I think you'll still be fine, you, and you won't hit any pitfalls using that set of plans and that template. I hope that helps, man. Uh, that's it, let's go do some guitar making how about that all right guys so here we are i've got my soundboard here one of many that i will be profiling this afternoon and the first step here is just to identify where on this blank canvas we want our guitar to be so uh, first and foremost let me just point out that this is overly thick at this point. So I don't thickness these fully until after I've cut out the plates. Not everyone does it this way. You can thickness these big sheets here and then cut them out. Um, there's kind of not a big 
difference between doing it one way as opposed to the other. And I gotta turn off my damn phone because this keeps happening. That is a fail on my part. Sorry guys. Phone off. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, these are overly thick, but you can do it either way. You could thickness first and then cut out the guitar shape or cut out the shape first and then thickness. All right, so I have my nice half template right here. You could also just use your internal or external mold that you've created for assembling your guitar. And let me just point out some things to avoid. So I know in this case, on this guitar, there's clearly this big knot right here. Well, I can put that right where the waist will be. That's a good way to avoid this knot, okay? Other things I want to avoid, when I jointed this, I left a little area here. There, there was daylight from about there up. And I can see that right now. There's a gap up there. It's okay I did that intentionally because I know that typically when you have your plates that you're joining, they're usually extra long. And so you don't have to get a perfect seam all the way out to the very end. So it's very common on my plates uh, when I joint these to, for me to stop early because it's just unnecessary to, you know, I can leave those ends uh, gappy and that's fine because they'll get cut off but it's good to know that at this point now this is interesting so I didn't see this on this side but that's why it's a good idea to check both sides because there's these two nasty knots down here and we can avoid those as well because the thing is you might say oh well I can just choose this to be the top side but because these plates are so thin and we haven't fully thicknessed them yet, there's a very good chance that this would start to reveal itself as soon as we started sanding on this. So to avoid that, we could also just say, okay, we don't want that area. So that actually puts me right in this spot, right here in the middle. Okay, there it is. To the bandsaw. Let me start by talking about the setup that I have here on the bandsaw. So first of all, on this bandsaw, I always keep a quarter inch blade. Now I should mention I have two bandsaws uh, just so that I don't have to swap out blades all the time. This is my smaller bandsaw and this one always has that quarter inch blade. For this task, probably the most ideal size bandsaw blade would actually be even smaller than this. You could use like an eighth of an inch bandsaw blade. The small blades are good for doing curves in thin material. The thicker the material gets and the straighter the cut gets, the more you require a larger blade. On the other bandsaw, I keep a three quarter of an inch blade for heavy mill work and resawing and stuff like that. Um, the reason I don't use an eighth of an inch here and I use a quarter inch is because this smaller bandsaw does a lot of tasks that, uh, that sort of in-between quarter inch blade just works well for a lot of different things and it's good enough for this profiling step but if i was you know setting this up just for profiling i would use the eighth of an inch blade so i just want to point that out now other things we want to do we just want to lower the um, guide bushings down here a little bit to uh, just above the thickness of our workpiece. That just keeps the blade more stable. And having your guide bushings set up as well 
also helps, but these are just always set up. I, I almost never have to touch them, which is nice. And here, I'll show you what the setup looks like. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but there's, uh, I'm not sure, a sixteenth of an inch, a little less than the sixteenth of an inch between the blade itself and the edge of these guide bearings. Okay, and then there's a third guide bearing in the back here. That's also important. So you want to have all of those set up so that there's just a little bit of space between the blade and those guide bearings. And lastly, I just want to point out that the guide bearings are set up so that if they hit the blade, they hit it behind the teeth, not on the teeth or ahead of the teeth. Can you see that? That's important because this blade, this blade does get jostled around a little bit. And when it does hit these guide bearings, you don't want the teeth to hit the metal of the guide bearings. You want the smooth back edge of that blade. All right, now as I cut this, I'm going to keep the dust collection off for now, just so that you can hear me. So basically I am suffering for the sake of you guys. Um, the dust that I will inhale will probably take uh, days, if not weeks, or maybe even years off of my life. Too dark? Yeah, probably too dark. Okay. Um, anyway, what I like to do, you know, we've got some significant curves here. I always like to make it a little bit easier on myself, and I first just make two straight cuts into the waist, because that waist, as you descend down into it and try and climb back out, it's the tightest curve in here. And with the quarter inch blade, it's, uh, it's a little tough for that size blade to handle. So I'll show you what I mean. So I just go in straight and then back out. Now this is very important. I am holding this very loosely. What you don't want to do is death grip the workpiece and try and force it around because you are also forcing that blade side to side and putting stress on it. But if you actually just hold this gently, it's a bit counterintuitive because with all these other tools that have kickback that we're worried about, you have to firmly hold the workpiece. This does not have kickback. All the force goes straight down into the table rather than out and towards you. So you can actually hold this very loosely, which is beneficial. And that's what we're going to do. Now I'm going to do the same thing here because this part of the bandsaw is kind of in the way. I'm just going to turn this to the side like this. And then back it out. All right, now let's cut the rest of it. fact that you always want to be moving when you do this okay so since we're always turning you always want to be advancing the workpiece forward as you're turning rather than uh, what a lot of people who are anxious about this about using a, a bandsaw for the first time what they tend to do what I see is they will advance in a straight line and then basically stop and then turn and then advance a little bit, stop, 
turn, advance a little bit, stop, turn. That is actually how you stress the blade and break it because the blade is going to bind up. If it's not moving as you're turning, if you're completely stopped and then you try and turn it, you're twisting the blade. Whereas if you're advancing the workpiece as you're turning, you're not twisting the blade. So it actually just takes a little bit of confidence to do that. You just have to be confident enough to keep moving as you're turning rather than trying to break it down into little steps. Go forward, then turn. Go forward, then turn. Don't do that. Okay. There it is. So of course, you'll notice here that I'm cutting outside the lines, not directly on the line. That's because after this is glued down to the rim set, I will use a router bit with a flush trim bearing to trim off all the excess outside of the guitar. Um, and you'll also notice that I'm not even I didn't even make a really good effort to stay consistently away from that line. It's just not all that important. So it, that, that's why I said earlier, it is a pretty simple job. You don't have to worry, uh, you know, too much about staying right on your line or anything like that. It's more about doing it in a way that doesn't stress, damage, or break your bandsaw blade. Okay, well, there you have it. All right, I'm gonna keep doing this, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your days. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.